Good morning everyone, welcome to the Pacific Northwest and to Seattle. We're at Boeing Field this morning and we're off inside the Museum of Flight to see the 747 that was the first one to come off the line, RA001. That and so many other things. Let's go inside the museum. So no trip to this museum would be complete without seeing what is the jewel in the crown of any uh, museum. Um, you'll see the numbers behind me here, RA001. For those of you who are familiar with my blog and my videos will know that this is an aeroplane which is truly, truly uh, uh, my passion. It's the city of Everett, it's the first 747, the first jumbo jet ever to fly. Uh, 9th of February 1969, this aeroplane was taken up by uh, the chief, pilot, chief test pilot of Boeing uh, and truly revolutionised air travel after that. It was the first wide body jet ever built uh, and is still today changing the world. So what made the Jumbo different? Why was the Jumbo so different in the 1960s? What made it different? Well, it was the first wide-bodied airliner. It had two aisles uh, for passengers, um, which made it from the internal point of view very different. But one of the big differences was this behind us, was the Pratt & Whitney GT9D, uh, which was one of the first high bypass engines ever built. An amazing engine which gave it the power and the thrust to lift the jumbo jet off the ground. There was no other engine around at the time that could do that. They had huge problems with this engine when they brought it into service. Um, it was really challenging uh, and actually it almost broke Boeing, uh, the delays, because of the engine. Boeing almost went into bankruptcy over this project, but it didn't. Let's have a look at the wing, because the wing was another one of the great special things about this aeroplane that allowed it to land at short airfields and take off at massively high weight. So, here's the wing. The wing of the 747, a unique, at the time, piece of engineering. Uh, the wing was designed to allow it to land on some of the smallest airfields around and to lift the massive weights that this aeroplane had over the 707 and the 727 uh, to make it across transcontinental, truly transatlantic. Um, what was the difference? Well, actually, it was these things here, Kruger flaps at the leading edge of the uh, wing, and it had triple slotted flaps at the back end of the wing. Um, that increased the wing size by about 21-22% um, when the aircraft was taking off and landing. Um, and what that did was increase lift by over 90%. Well, it's difficult to believe that this was first conceived in the uh, spring of 1963. And just a little under six years later, Boeing flew this aeroplane for the first time. An amazing engineering feat if you imagine that they got it off the drawing board and into the end six years. That just doesn't happen even in modern times with airliners. Well, when I fly my 747, um, it looks very different to this. Uh, this is the inside of the uh, original number one test bed. Um, as you can see up in the uh, ceiling, the ceiling is exposed in this aircraft to give you an idea of how large the aircraft actually is. Um, when you have the cabin roof in it, it does actually feel quite claustrophobic. Um, but it also gives you an, an impression this aircraft is just about the same width as the 747-400. So actually it gives you an idea of how wide it actually is with nothing in it. It actually does look cavernous. Now this aircraft was originally designed um, in the time when supersonic travel was going to be the next big thing, uh, the SST, Boeing was developing the SST, uh, the collaboration in Europe was developing Concorde, and Boeing never really thought that subsonic travel would continue. So when they built this aircraft, they thought about a freighter uh, uh, and a secondary use for it rather than subsonic passenger travel. So when the aircraft was built, that's why it has the upper deck, the cockpit on the upper deck, so you could have the swing nose and way back there would be the swing nose would lift and you would have this massive cavernous flat area to push cargo in uh, and it was designed to be able to have a double pallet all the way down here. 
So this is why the 747 has been so successful over the years, not only as a passenger aircraft, but actually as a freighter as well. Um, and that's why the upper deck was conceived. Many people probably don't know that. Many people would have thought it was a place to go up and have a nice drink and have a business class seat. Well, actually, originally it was conceived to allow the freight to go below it. And it was only Juan Tripp who actually, when he saw the space behind the flight deck, decided this is a place to put a bar and we could have some fun up here. And obviously over the years that's developed and we've had a much larger upper deck on the 400 and the Dash 8 series. What we're going to do is we're going to have a go to the end of this because actually I posted a photograph a couple of months ago about um, a tanker version of this uh, and this was the original test bed for the tanker and we're just going to go and have a look at that at the rear. It's amazing that uh, the 747 has really uh, been an engineering feat that stood the test of time really. Um, I look at this aircraft here behind us, number one, and actually the basic design of this versus the 747-400 or even the 8 now is essentially the same. The engines have changed, the airframe's a bit bigger, but essentially the idea was so good back in the 60s that we still use it today.